Okay. Hello. Hello, everyone. Good afternoon and welcome to the 58th Asian Impact Webinar of the Asian Development Bank. I am Wena Cham from the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of the ADB, and I will be your moderator for this afternoon's webinar. It is a Friday afternoon here in Manila, and everyone is already looking forward to the weekend. However, for those who are back to work and going to the office regularly, traffic seems to be returning to the pre-pandemic times. During the height of the COVID-19 pandemic, you would not see crowded buses, overflowing jeepneys, and lines of vehicles in EDSA, which is the main thoroughfare for most commuters. While the government has been trying for some time to resolve this issue, this has been a perennial problem. So can mass transport help resolve this? In this webinar, we have a presentation on the North-South Commuter Rail Project, which is a project that links Metro Manila with Clark City in the north and Calamba in the south. We will hear from our experts as to how mass tra transit infrastructure can have a wide range of development benefits, many of which are not captured in the traditional cost-benefit analysis. So beyond shorter commuting times and improved traffic, such investments can have the potential in altering the economic landscape of a metropolis as firms and households now have the option to relocate. And with proper land use planning and development policies, these benefits can be amplified. We will also hear from our distinguished panelists as to how the experience from the North-South Commuter Rail Project can guide the design of policies tied to large-scale infrastructure projects on promoting regional economic development. So in terms of the format for this afternoon's webinar, we will first have a 20-minute presentation on the economic impacts of urban transit infrastructure upgrading case of the North-South Commuter Rail in the Philippines. And then we move on to the Q&A session with our panel of experts. So and now to present the findings of the report, we have the privilege of having our presenters. Namely, Mr. Yi Jiang, who is a principal economist at the Economic Research and Regional Cooperation Department of the ADP. Yi's research focuses on urbanization, infrastructure, and economic development. Yi's co-presenter this afternoon is Ms. Julia Bird, who is a senior economist at Vivid Economics. Julia is an expert on urbanization, sustainable development, economic modeling, and geospatial and big data analytics. So now let me give the screen to Yi and Julia to walk us through the findings of the study. Thank you, Werner. So let me share my screen. Uh, good afternoon, um, everyone. Thank you for uh, participating in this uh, webinar. So this study is jointly done by an ADB team and a McKinsey team led by Dr. Julia Bird. We take the North-South Commuter Railway in the Philippines as a case to understand and quantify the economic impacts of large urban transit infrastructure. Today, Julia and I are presenting some preliminary results obtained so far. Here is uh, what we do and why we do it in one page. The North-South Commuter Railway is a major infrastructure project connecting New Clark City in the North, Metro Manila, and the Columbia City in the South. It will substantially reduce travel times between locations on the route and also has a big price tag. Traditional economic analysis measures the benefits of such transport project through vehicle operating cost and the travel time savings. However, a major infrastructure project that is of the size of this North-South commuter rail can affect the location decisions of household firms and the housing developers changing the spatial distributions of economic activity within a city, which is not captured in the traditional cost-benefit analysis. We utilized a spatial computable general equilibrium that incorporates changes in geographical allocation of household firms and the developers over time to provide a richer set of results on the potential costs and the benefits of this major infrastructure project. Metro Manila and the surrounding areas considered as the catchment area in this study will be profoundly impacted by the project. As we know, Metro Manila is one of the uh, world's most densely populated cities with 28,000 people per square kilometer. 
dancers in mega cities like uh, Mumbai, Paris, and the Great Tokyo. It is also the most economically vital region in the country, accounting for one third of national GDP, with highest GDP per capita and the lowest poverty incidence and the un unemployment rate in the country. It has been growing fast and attracting businesses and the people continuously. On the other hand, it is ranked the most congested Asian city in an ADB report published in 2019. It is estimated that congestion results, uh, congestion results in an economic loss of $54 million per day in Metro Manila. The number of private vehicles on the roads have been growing rapidly in the past decade. Statistics show that the vehicle density in Metro Manila reached uh, 1,900 per kilometer as opposed to 230 per kilometer in Singapore. Metro Manila also lacks green or open space. Air pollution is significantly above international standard. It, it is interesting to note that uh, Metro Manila actually has the extensive network of roads, of roads, but very high density of vehicles by length of roads. On the other hand, the real, the real network is rather sparse in Metro Manila which is associated with the high congestion level. In addition to a 28 kilometer southbound commuter line, there are only three mass transit lines serving 4% of total daily trips in Metro Manila. Buses and the Japanese are the primary public transportation the city heavily relies on, which however are very slow. We also look into the distribution of workers and housing in the region. High skilled workers, are more concentrated in Metro Manila while low skilled mostly in outskirts. Low quality housing is dominant in faraway suburban areas and highly dense cities in Metro Manila, such as Calucan, City of Manila, and Quezon City. The North South Commuter Rail is government's flagship infrastructure project. It consists of three segments with total length of 163 kilometer. The North South Commuter Rail line is expected to cut travel times from three, uh, two to three hours to one hour, ease congestion and provide environmentally friendly options of transport. It is Philippines first airport rail shuttle with direct link to the Clark International Airport. Now South commuter rail passes through 28 cities and the municipalities with substa uh, substantial spatial spillovers to neighboring jurisdictions. We identify 119 cities and municipalities in our catchment area, which could bear economic effects of the North-South commuter rail. The project is expected to cost more than 15 billion US dollar. ADB is one of the largest financiers for the project and also provided technical assistance to the project. With these backgrounds, let me turn the floor over to Dr. Bird on the details of the modeling exercise and the results we obtained. Julia, please. Brilliant, thank you very much, Ian. Um, very happy to be discussing this. So this is some research we've been um, working on um, over the last year and a bit. Um, and it's based off of research um, that I had worked on um, previously in my career um, in the city of Dhaka in, in Bangladesh. So if you can go to the next slide, um, please, Yi. So the work essentially goes beyond the normal sorts of cost benefit analysis you would see when you're looking at transport infrastructure investments. Um, now that's not to say that those normal cost benefit analysis aren't useful, they very much are. They're showing you the direct impacts of transport um, connections. They're showing you um, very sort of measurable um, ways of seeing impacts um, on the city. But we know that the economy of the city is a broader system um, and that a transport shock of this scale isn't just going to affect the vicinity of the railway, but it's also going to affect um, the interactions that are happening elsewhere in the city and how firms and households and developers behave going forward. So there are four main pillars to the SCG model that we use to consider some of those broader economic impacts and how the North South Rail may affect the overall long term outlook of the city and the long term shape and development of the city. So what we are doing is we're breaking it down into an economic model where we've got households, 
firms, developers who are looking at land, and then all of those are interconnected by trade and location across the city. So households, people who are living within um, the Greater Manila area, they're demanding goods and services. They are providing labor, they're providing people to go and work jobs, and they are living in housing within the city. And we have in a very stylized way, and this model is stylized, we have to reduce it and, and make assumptions. In a very stylized way, we have two types of households. We have high skilled and low skilled. Then within the city as well, we have firms. And in a very stylized way, again, we've got three different types of firm, which kind of represent um, at a high level, manufacturing, business services and local services. And they are split. You can imagine that a manufacturing-esque firm requires a lot of land um, to do its production relative to the others. Um, and it requires quite a lot of primary materials. You've got a local services firms. Now they need to be located essentially very near the consumers. This is things like your local hairdresser, your local retail center. You're not prepared to travel an hour across the city to go um, and, and buy um, um, uh, some chicken for dinner. You, you want to go quite locally. Um, and then we've got business services firms. Now they tend to, to cluster a bit more here. We're talking about our banking hubs, our legal hubs. These are the types of firms that you might go to once in, in, in every few months, or indeed they serve other firms quite a lot. So firms demand goods and services and they supply goods and services, but they also need some land and they need um, labor inputs. Then we've got developers, um, and now developers are producing housing essentially within the city um, and commercial floor space. So they're taking land and they are building upwards, they're building out, and they're providing different elements. Now we've got a distinction in terms of housing. It's listed here as formal, informal, um, or high quality, low quality. This is a broad brush distinction. Essentially what you can imagine is by high quality or formal, we're thinking about sort of modern, um, multi-story, quite dense apartment building and, and high rise. By the more sort of low quality, we're talking about more traditional building approaches, um, more spread out, higher land inputs um, for um, a given floor space produced. And then finally, we've got, as, as you mentioned, we've got all of these different locations across the city. They trade with each other. So you've got a transport connection between all the pairs of locations within the city, be that by rail, be that by road. And you can have goods, services, and most importantly, labor, people moving around the city according to those transport locations. The amount of transport that you do in a given day affects your utility, affects your welfare as a household, um, and then it also affects the price of goods in different locations. And in the long run, in equilibrium, firms and households can choose where they're based. Now, if you can go next slide, please, Yi, I will just talk through very quickly how do we solve this and, and what this looks like. So I've just mentioned that the core components, um, each of these create markets. We've got land markets, housing markets, product markets and factor markets. So we, we've essentially got the labour market. Each of the locations within the city, we've got the demand, we've got the supply coming out of the model and the structured assumptions that we put in it. At equilibrium, they have to join up and we have to get wages, rents, um, prices for housing um, and prices for goods and services. And that is where we land when, when we're at equilibrium. Next slide, please. So um, just to give you a very brief summary of how we've um, applied this within the Greater Manila region. So we split it into 119 geographical units. Um, we've got the workers um, traveling or people traveling across the city to get between their place of residence and their place of work and their utility falls as transport costs increase um, between wherever they're living and where they're working. So workers choose that pair of location where they live and where they work. We've simultaneously got the goods and services that must be delivered out around the city. Um, and the combination of intermediate linkages between firms, firms use other goods and services in their production. And then again, also the costs of um, sort of bringing in labor from elsewhere in the city, because that's affecting utility, you've got to compensate that with, with higher wages. Um, so all of that creates an initial force of agglomeration, which, which happens within the model. Next slide, please. So I do just want to sort of put my hands up and say there are some caveats to this model. Um, I think the numbers that come out of it are really illuminating about what might be going on and help us think about the trade-offs and the mechanisms, but they are not pure predictions about the future. 
Um, this is a model which really looks at the internal dynamics of the city with some underlying assumptions. What it doesn't do is look at the big macroeconomic perspective of what's happening in the Philippines and how the country is changing over the time. So what we can tell you is given certain investments, how might that shape the spatial distribution of growth within the city? How might that make it more likely that Clark City is, is a real successful hub versus um, the traditional old center of Manila? Um, we can talk through the trade-offs and relationships there. What we can't tell you is whether Manila is going to be the new uh, software hub of, of the broader region and is going to attract loads of international firms. We can't talk about those big sort of macroeconomic questions. So we have to make some level sort of assumptions and then we're looking at the internal dynamics of the city. There are also a lot of other things underway at the same time. So we've tried to pull out some of those core things and look at how they impact it. But obviously there are other things going on as well. And ultimately um, the, the success of the city is going to depend on, on all that combination. But what it is about is understanding the core relationships and the mechanisms at play. And it helps us build up a story of the relative benefits of different options and a scale of those benefits. And what you'll see when we come to the results is, is that you know, doing one thing in isolation has a much smaller impact than coordinating different policies at once. And if you can coordinate policies to support a narrative, to support an approach, then you can really transform an area of a city and you can really have, have that sort of magnified impact. It also allows us to test the feasibility of achieving certain ambitions. So, um, you know, thinking about building a new cluster um, and, and a new economic hub, is that realistic? How much is, is, is that really going to um, cost um, the economy? Can you really attract firms there? So if you could go through to the next slide, please, I'm going to talk through, first of all, what um, sort of scenarios we've looked at, and then I'm going to give you a, a sort of brief summary of some different results um, to draw out some of what I think are some of the interesting um, elements that are coming out of this. So what we have done is we've calibrated this model um, on sort of current day Manila, or it's it, recent years Manila, we've had to sort of gather data from, from different sources. Um, and we've got the model in equilibrium and we said, OK, this is what the city looks like today. And then we say, OK, well, let's project forward. The North South Rail is going to take a while to implement. And then, of course, its impacts on housing, firm location, et cetera, will take a while to play out. So we project forward to 2040 by assuming population growth and plugging that into the model. And then in our scenario A, we just look at the completion of the north section of the north-south rail. So this is essentially changing connectivity between areas of those 119 areas. It's changing connectivity within the north of the city, but also connectivity between some of those areas to other parts of the city. As that is happening, of course, other parts of the city that might not be directly impacted, their relative levels of connectivity compared to other parts of the city are changing. So there are going to be mechanisms, there are going to be things that make firms more or less likely to want to locate in some of those other parts of the city. In scenario B, we then extend that. We complete the whole of the north-south commuter rail right from the very north to, to the very south. And we also look at some complementary infrastructure. So if you build in last mile connectivity, if you really think about connecting from the north-south rail into local communities, how does that um, in, enhance things further? Scenario C is where things, when we look at the results, where you'll see things strikingly become very different. Scenario C says, OK, not only are you completing these transport projects, but you're also facilitating new land to be developed. And essentially, these transport projects are opening up areas of the city that haven't yet necessarily been developed and allowing more economic activity to take place there. But one thing that really changes the magnitude and the size of the, size of the results is looking at land that has yet to be developed and saying, what happens if the development rules um, there um, enable development? Now, if I recall correctly, what we looked at um, is um, developable or sort of immediately developable um, or, or relatively easily developable greenfield land um, and brownfield land. Um, but what we excluded was protected areas. And we said that would never be developable. But there is some land which could be developable with some changes in rules. And how does that interact with the building of the North South Rail if, if we use those land um, development restrictions? 
Then scenarios D and E, um, we state essentially that there are some ambitions to create new economic clusters and hubs within the city. Um, if you think about the Greater Manila region, you've got areas where there's um, a lot of congestion, a high density of firms. What would happen if you tried to encourage one or two new clusters far sort of further out and, and along the north south rail? Um, we do that by looking at some business incentives, basically reducing the cost of doing business in these areas. Um, in limited areas, and we do see this, this new cluster forming. Um, we've done that for one cluster and for two clusters. What's really striking there is when we make the agglomeration economies that bit stronger, and you can see there's a trade-off between the number of locations that you choose to really target business policies and the success of those. And once you've got, if you're in a location or if you're in an environment or in a sector where you've got strong agglomeration economies, choosing multiple clusters as the hubs for, for that sector may actually be to, to the city's disadvantage. So next slide, please. I'm aware of time. I'm going to go through a couple of results. Um, and if um, you could signal to me whenever you want me to, to stop um, and, and I can just illuminate on some things. So I actually think um, I've talked through this slide at a, at a high level um, with, with, with the scenario. So if we could go to the next slide, I will just talk through um, some, some of the um, details of, of the first one. So the, the, the core element here is that this is scenario A, eh? this is just the north section of the North South Rail. Now it has some impacts and you've got to imagine a lot of these impacts are, are sort of above and beyond the traditional cost benefit analysis measurements. These are not the direct job impacts. It has an impact on, on, on GVA for the city and it is enhancing that. But in terms of where firms are locating, in terms of where households are locating and where terms of the wages, the shift is relatively little. This is not transforming the spatial geography of the city. It is changing connectivity to a number of locations. It is impacting wages, um, but at a, at a relatively small level, about $200 per year once we've, we've done our sense checking. You can see, that'd be great if you can go on to the next slide, you can see on the next slide that we've got the blues here, which are increases. So on the left-hand side, you've got the change in population, which is really, you've got an increase in population. People want to locate to the north, less so to the south. Um, you've got better connectivity in the north now, so it's relatively more desirable. Um, and this is changing where local services are. This is changing where employment entities are. So you are getting some of these changes. Um, you're also here, and, and this is something just to be a bit aware of when, when we're looking at these results, because think about what the baseline is. There's some quite, there are some cells with some quite large percentage changes. Um, often that might be because we're starting at a relatively low baseline. So we need to look at both the percentage changes and, and the absolute changes here. If you can flick onto the next slide, please. Um, those population changes um, have sort of resultant impacts because all of these markets are interconnected. They have resultant impacts on, on rents. So people want to locate more in the north, um, it's better connected. Um, some of the local services firms want to be located around those people. Um, we've got rent increases in the north. Um, we've got this, this growth happening in the north. This is reducing relative rents, um, everything else constant. This is reducing relative rents towards the south. And the manufacturing firms, or essentially the firms that require large land concentrations, um, therefore expand in those areas where it is now relatively cheaper for them to connect to. So we're seeing that growth in manufacturing actually coming through in the south. The south, the manufacturing, traditional manufacturing is benefiting less from the rail than commuter flows and, and, and local services and, and business services. If you can flick forward, please. Um, I am going to skip through this one and then go through onto the next scenario. So I just want to set out how a land um, deregulation changes things. Um, now, this is a, an example policy. Now, obviously, the details of what could potentially be implemented in Greater Manila are very potentially very different. But by unlocking land, and this is quite a large chunk of, of, of land that we are unlocking, um, so we're increasing it by 2.3 million kilometres squared. It's, it's really vast areas of, of greenfield land saying are developable. This is enormously scaling the impact of the North South Rail because suddenly there are tranches of land along the along the connections which could be developed and which could be developed into business services, local services and manufacturing and, of course, new housing. 
And this is when the North South Rail starts to have transformational impacts. And we're having a huge impact in, 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 in employment in the area. We've got GVA going up by about $12 billion. I should caveat all of this and say these are preliminary results. Um, and Yi and myself are going to be working, um, going through these numbers in, in the coming weeks to make sure we're, we're content with them. So they are preliminary, but you're seeing that sort of explosion in, in terms of the scale. Impacts further on total land rents. Um, we've got an increase in total land. Rent per unit area is going down, but the total rents collected across the city are increasing. And, and then we've got more and more households living in what is termed low quality housing. But I want to reframe that and say this is housing that is essentially less dense. This is housing that is more traditional methods of housing. We're not compacting people in into um, and into high rises. Now, there are pros and cons of that, but it's it's worth just sort of illuminating that that, that is happening. I'm aware I need to wrap up. So I wanted to just really show you those sort of examples of, of what's going on and the mechanisms that are at play there. Um, if you could flick forward, please, Yi, onto the conclusion slide. Um, I think it would just be a good one to land on and people can just see some of the messages that are coming out. Um, and then um, I'm happy to sort of answer questions on, on other things. As you can see, we're, we're working through lots of scenarios and, and we had far too much to, to share with you in the time limit. So thank you very much, everyone, for, for listening to that. And, um, and hopefully you find this type of modelling illuminating as to what's going on. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Yi and Julia, for a comprehensive presentation and setting the stage for our um, discussion. But before we start our Q&A session, let me introduce our panelists for this afternoon. Our first panelist is Mr. Roderick Planta, who is currently designated as the Assistant Secretary for Infrastructure, um, for Infrastructure Development of the National Economic and Development Authority Investment Programming Group. ASEC Eric is a career official and has held director positions in NEDA's monitoring and evaluation staff and the infrastructure staff prior to his current position. Our second panelist is Mr. Arturo Corpus. Art is an urban and regional planner, and he is an expert on urban and regional development and related policies, um, planning and development strategies, and investment priorities. So Art was in the academe. He worked in the private sector and also served as consultant and advisor of the National Economic Development Authority, the World Bank, and the Asian Development Bank. Our third panelist is Mr. James Leather. So Jamie is the current chief of the transport sector group of the Asian Development Bank. So aside from leading the ADB's transport sector operations, he also oversees the strategic direction of ADB's knowledge, technical, and financial support to its DMCs, um, private sector clients, and partners. Okay. So since we want to make this a lively discussion, um, I will kick off with a few questions to our panelists, but we would also like to hear from the audience. So please type in your questions into the Q&A box, which you can find at the right side or at the bottom of your screen. And please do give the thumbs up or like existing questions and we will try to address, address them as appropriate. Um, for the in, in the interest of time, I would like to request the panelists to limit your, um, your responses to about three minutes, so we can have more times for uh, we have more time for question and answer. So, Asik Eric, I would like to if we can start with you. So <laughs> we yes, so we heard from the State of the Nation address of um, President Marcos that the current administration will continue the build 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 program of um, the Duterte administration. And um, the transport sector was highlighted as one of the priorities. So the president enumerated actually a number of um, rail projects, and not only not only located in uh, Metro Manila, but also in other parts of the Philippines. So can you share with us what has held back the development of the rail subsector, even, even if, like, for example, the Philippine National Railways, which was set up um, some 130 years ago? Asik Eric? Yeah, thank you, Ena. Thank you for inviting NEDA to this uh, activity. Well, of course, the formal answers are the formal assessments are always often done uh, before the uh, as part of the Philippine Development Plan, and uh, we have also an annual uh, socio-economic report uh, where we uh, 
uh, sort of uh, uh, review the uh, annual performance of the sector. Uh, but the facts uh, really are very instructive. Uh, for the past uh, so many years, we have really underinvested in infrastructure uh, as, a, as a sector, uh, not even talking about the subsector. Uh, I have data here that says that in 1999, our total investment for infra is about 55 billion pesos only. That uh, corresponds to about 1.1% of G, uh, GDP. And then uh, still up to 2012, it's 215 billion, 2% uh, of GDP. So we really started uh, ramping up the infrastructure investment. Uh, 2015, 2016 at 4.1%, 4 4.3, 4 and the uh, entire administration is at five. The build better more is uh, again, uh, uh, continuing in that uh, trajectory. So meaning to say that uh, the trans 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 transportation resource en envelope did not really uh, expand as much for the past uh, so many years. And if we, uh, uh, by that we can uh, really infer that uh, if uh, the approval states it's not it's not the bottleneck, then the, we could uh, uh, narrow it down to project preparation, project development uh, as the sort of a logical uh, culprit uh, in the development. Of course, we could uh, say that there are so many related factors for that, uh, viabilities, uh, viability consideration, right of way, but. Uh, it's just the it's just the project development cycle not churning out uh, ready to go projects for, for approval and for subsequent financing and then implementation. So thank, thank you, you very much. Thank you very much, Asset Planta. So now let me ask um, Art. Art, as a practicing urban and regional planner, can you share with us your views on um, how the Philippine government's planning process can further improve when it comes to planning for these large infrastructure projects? Yes, uh, uh, th thank you for the question. I think uh, and getting to the heart of what, uh, what Julia also mentioned, I, uh, the, I think the, the planning process needs to uh, allow the properties within the area of the uh, NSCR influence and other infrastructure for that matter to respond to opportunities uh, resulting from improved mobility and increased access. So in the Philippine context, uh, I, I refer specifically, specifically to removing uh, the regulations that are zero-sum and misleading uh, anti-urban policies. And uh, clearly, uh, we need to protect uh, prime agricultural lands and environmentally sensitive disaster prone areas. But this does not have to be a zero sum uh, 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 approach. You know. For example, uh, preventing urban expansion around the cities, the large cities, will require more than double total urban land if you compare to just uh, letting the smaller cities and the smaller settlements absorb the additional population. So in other words, uh, preventing urban expansion in the interest supposedly of, 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 of land conversion, preventing land conversion, actually uh, uh, leads to more conversion. So there's, there, there, these are some of these why sometimes it's misleading. Or another example there, and he said from a broader point of view, uh, a more positive uh, perspective is uh, we need to increase agricultural productivity because if we have more productive land, then we will need less agricultural land. Globally, the total agricultural land has been declining since the 1990s because of increased productivity despite increasing global population. In the Philippines, our productivity has hardly grown over the past decades. And our agricultural land inventory is, is continues to grow uh, through the years. So there, there's uh, there's again synergy in the uh, between the urban and rural sectors or agri and urban uh, in, in this case. Maybe just to also uh, uh, emphasize that another uh, area that uh, could be looked into is to again uh, relates to what Julia said is to make sure that the infrastructure support network is in place. This is especially relevant to the NSCR because 
the corridor of the NSCR is, a, is already a developed corridor. Uh, remember, this is the essentially the right of way of the PNR, which is built of more than a century ago. So while the areas immediately around the stations can react directly and benefit, we need to make sure that the connections to the outer areas, outer communities are put in place. Now, uh, that's a, that's, that seems to be simple and easy, but it's not as, uh, it can be quite challenging uh, given the, the institutions and the history of which land use planning and zoning has, has taken place. And maybe just to uh, add one more policy area, I think uh, that needs to, that can be uh, uh, helpful so the last point is, that is to, to complete the, invent, the ground level inventory of the protected areas, because uh, right now uh, the policy is very, uh, has a very blanket approach. You know, if, if you look at the draft of the National Land Use Bill, the recent drafts, it talks about preventing settlements in alluvial plains or preventing settlements in areas that are seismically active. And that's the entire country, you know? So we need to go down to the ground level mm -hmm. and make sure that these are, are uh, defined and, and therefore we can proceed and find out where we can put the infrastructure, where we can uh, build up the areas that can respond to this improved uh, mobility and access uh, allowed by the NSCR and such similar projects. Okay, thank you very much, Art. I, it seems that, uh, you know, a lot of land related policies uh, need to be also um, reviewed or looked into. But before we go, we have um, a number of um, questions on, on, on the model itself. But before we go, that we, we would like to ask our third panel, Jamie, um, ADB has played a major role in the transport sector in most of our uh, the ADB DMCs. Actually, where, while there have been an increase in railway investments in recent years, um, it's it's one of the sector the subsector that lags behind road transport. So, um, in terms of the ADB portfolio, can you share with us your thoughts on how ADB can help boost uh, public and private investments in rail and mass transit? Thank you very much. Um, let me just start by saying that all of transport sectors, subsectors, should be seen as an integrated system, both whether that's public transport or the north-south commuter rail in Manila must be connected to local distributions, be they the bus services, the jeepneys or the tricycles and the paratransit. So we must look at transport in that context. Yes, we have provided a lot of support to the road subsector. And just to put it in, again in context, the EU, which is perhaps invested the most in a multimodal integrated transport system, their passenger and their freight movements are still 74% and 76%. Sorry, I can't remember which one is freight and which one is, is passenger, but basically three quarters of both passenger and freight still travel by road. There are competitive advantage. But having said that, there are competitive advantages where different transport modes must be promoted to provide that better service. The North-South commuter rail is a perfect example where you have to move such a huge volume of people in a very congested urban area where the available space for moving that many people is incredibly limited. Railways for passengers has the advantage you can move far more people quickly with far less space required. So that's an absolute given in many he heavily densely populated urban areas. Railway mm -hmm. must always form the backbone of an integrated public transport system. Another sort of rule of thumb, and sorry, these aren't hardcore numbers, but our estimate shows that a sustainable urban transport system should have around 70% of the trips made by public transport and non-motorized transport and around 30% by private modes, cars and motorbikes. If not, you're going to have severe congestions and the sorts of numbers we heard in estimated GDP loss from congestion. Now, in terms of stimulating the investment, both public and private, in, in rail. It's really highlighting that critical point, where, which parts of the transport network are better served by rail, be that long distance freight connecting ports to the edges of urban areas and then putting inland container terminals for do that distribution. Absolutely essential in, in, in all urban areas. 
for commuter rail, metro systems, underground systems to provide that backbone. What we did in ADB from a sort of an inward push was to set targets. We had a heavily dominant road subsector mm -hmm. going back as far as 2010. It was around 90% of our support and assistance was in the roads subsector. We realized that wasn't addressing the needs of our clients and, and the other driving ambitions on more sustainable, more energy efficient, less emitting forms of transport. So we set sort of internal targets of around 20% for urban transport, public transport, and 20% for, for rail. Um, so now we have a much more balanced portfolio, 50% roads, around 25% heavy rail, interurban rail, and around 25% urban public transport, metro systems and buses. So that was an internal drive. But that only came about from having meaningful dialogues with our clients and saying, yes, roads are important, they will always be important, but we must prioritize these other forms of transport. And a couple of examples we have, our private sector have supported uh, metro projects in Bangkok. And obviously we are one of the main supporters of the rail system development in on the sovereign side in Metro Manila. So it's it's been a, a key shift in our focus and the skills and services we're offering support to our clients. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jamie. So um, now we want to um, get uh, hear the questions from uh, from our audience. And 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 I think uh, a number of these questions are for our presenters, Yi and Julia, if you uh, you can respond to this one. So um, it uh, it was saying that the presentation was kind of difficult to, to understand in terms of where the benefits are coming from. So it's clear that it will open up the land in the north for development because of, of, of where it is the project is located. But the question is, why will wages rise? Um, are some of the benefits from the reduced travel, are these from uh, uh, emanating from reduced travel times? Or And utility was also discussed or mentioned here. And what are the main increases in utility? Maybe Yi and Julia, either one of you can respond to this. Sure, I can I can jump in on that first, and then if he has anything to add. So um, there's a few things that come about here, and and it will depend on the scenario. Um, so first of all, um, so you've got because your travel costs are decreasing um, across the city, um, it's essentially costing a household less to get from point A to B in terms of their time. So it's making it a more um, competitive labour market. Um, in a sense, the number of people a firm in, um, in the centre of Manila, say, can um, reach in terms of the people who could be working for them and who have to commute less than an hour to get to them has increased as a result of the north-south commuter rail. And that is making it more competitive. The, the mechanism through, through which that's essentially happening in the model is that's increasing labour supply in that area or potential labour supply in that area. And so um, it's having that impact um, for the firm. So that's having an initial wage impact. And you're actually seeing in that first scenario that the wages for the lower skilled are actually decreasing slightly. Um, now, of course, that then has additional effects, though, that filter through. So then that affects the firm productivity. Um, when you do that on aggregate across the whole city, that's affecting prices um, of goods and services. And so that's having a sort of compensatory effect, um, which works against the so utility essentially is encompassing not just your wage, but it's also encompassing the costs that you are paying for goods, services and housing. And so that's making those that sort of composite basket slightly cheaper. And, and so meaning that the impact on utility isn't, isn't the same as, as the impact on wage. Um, in, in turn, that's having spillover effects going into other firms and businesses as well is because firms and businesses um, firms and firms and households use goods and services um, in their own production or in their own consumption. So you've got these mechanisms that, that go about through that. So all of that is, is, is having an impact. So those are at the initial level where we're seeing effects. There are further effects when we think about some of those um, later on scenarios. One is that when you have an increase in supply of one of your core resources in the city and one of the absolute core resources within any city is land um, and land is in um, short supply in, in every city around the world and particularly in a city such as Manila where you've got a lot of congestion um, you've got a heck of a lot of people in a relatively small area of space so if you're increasing land availability by changing the regulation there 
that is going to um, reduce a resource constraint. So then the rents per individual unit of land in the model are decreasing because we've got greater land supply relative to demand, but the total rents generated across the city are increasing. That is bolstering what firms can produce for any given price, um, boosting output, and then having further down the line effects on wages, on prices of goods and services, and so forth. What I would like to throw into that, though, as well, is that you can envisage in many ways that a transport investment does have an impact on land supply. And I want you to sort of think this through not so much in terms of a fixed element, but in terms of the area of land that is accessible from a given place in the city within a certain unit of time increases. So when you are located in the centre of Manila, you can reach out further to the north after the north-south commuter rail within a given hour because there's less congestion and better connectivity, which means the area of land that's connected to those agglomeration benefits to that hub in the city has increased and so you are effectively through transport investments you are effectively increasing land supply and and having those impacts so there's a whole lot of mechanisms going on there but i think that that land supply story is is a really key one the number of area the number of meters squared of land that you can reach within an hour the number of people the number of firms it all increases with the transport investment and if you increase the availability of land as well that multiplies that effect up um, many many times over Okay. Yi, do you have anything else to add? Um, maybe just uh, going through one of uh, the questions relating to the model. It, it's kind of technical, but you know, uh, impact on. There's a question saying about what what does it say about income redistribution, or if, for example, um, does also the model assume that there's no service trade across cities? Though meaning, but we, earlier we heard that you know people can travel, but now traveling to consume services such such as if you go to Clark, for example, where there's, uh, you know, you can do recreational activities, something that, to that effect. Yeah. And um, no, so you can travel to do services or to, to consume services. And actually, when we um, look at a cluster focused policy mm -hmm. in Clark City and we really increase um, the desirability of Clark City for businesses, basically by doing targeted um policies that reduce the cost of doing business in, in, in three areas um, in, in the Clark City vicinity, we actually see a, a boom in um, local and business services. That, that sort of service hub is, is, is what's going on there. Now, that's if we do across the board business cost reduction. Now, if the narrative that, that the um, area that Clark City wants to build out, if they actually want that to be a hub of um, something else of a different sector, then you've got to think further about, well, where do your business incentives target? But you do see that people do travel for services. It's just more costly to do so. Um, so it's relative to the cost of the good. So, you know, if you are getting um, legal services, I'm spending, um, I don't know, $1,000 um, to get legal services. And so the transport cost of getting there is relatively small relative to the cost of the good. If I'm buying a chicken, then the transport cost, if I'm traveling an hour within Manila to, to buy that chicken, the transport cost relative to the cost of the good is, is, is large. So essentially it's modeled in that way. We do, you can travel for services, but the cost of it relative to the cost of the individual good or service for, for those local services is, is, is much higher. Okay. I think Julia has made a very comprehensive explanation of the model mechanism. Uh, I see there's uh, still a few questions, technical questions yes. on the yes. on the model. Probably we can communicate offline on those uh, questions. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question for the panelists. Yes. Uh, I, I propose that we, we okay. go to those questions. Okay. When. So yes. Uh, so for Jamie, there's a question here in terms of the shift in priorities of ADB specialty and diversifying the portfolio to equally important sectors other than land transport only within the bank alone. And does this reflect similar sectoral shifts in the other ODA donors or financing institution? Is it more or less like ADB is kind of like trying to rebalance in terms of our, our portfolio? Our, the, the, have you based on your discussions with 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 other um, institutions are are they also moving into that kind of like a uh, uh, strategy? Um, collectively and individually, yes. And it, a lot of this would stem from a 
joint commitment the MDBs made at Rio plus 20 for investments in sustainable transport, and we defined what those may be. So it was urban mass transit, it was rail-based freight movements and other components as well. So that really pushed that. Mm -hmm. I would also add that the MDBs and other financiers' commitments to climate change, notably MDB's commitment to be aligned with the Paris Agreement 1st of July this year, again, the same methodology will be utilized across all of our projects. So again, that will drive this push in more sustainable forms of transport, more energy efficient forms of transport, less emitting forms of transport, which would put urban mass transit, commuter rail, and these types of projects the highest on our priorities. Thanks. Yeah. Thank you, Jamie. So um, just let me, uh, Art, if I can just come back to you based on the presentation and the discussion um, of the potential of this uh, large infrastructure projects, um, the benefits in terms of the land value capture, I think the, the what would, what in your opinion should be the, you know, the types of the, the what, what are the policies that um, are needed to actually unleash and maximize these such benefits, like you know, the first one to three of uh, policies that you can think of um, in terms of um, land policies. Uh, yes, uh, this is this relates to what I had mentioned earlier that mm -hmm. the, the biggest bang for the buck, and I think this is what the model also shows that uh, releasing uh, more land for okay. for development, responding to market opportunities uh, created by the increased mobility and access. That would that in general, I think, is is a very uh, say critical part of the uh, policy response. The other, some others would be related to uh, implementation. You know, like uh, in implementing these projects. For example, many of our projects are, are, are get get uh, you know they, they they can't proceed because of right of way. Right of way restricted. So I think the planning process and, and part of the policy should now more purposely, as part of the infrastructure planning, more purposely mm -hmm. look in or include uh, identifying pro and protecting rights of ways. Uh, mm -hmm. Make it a, an integral part of the in infrastructure planning process because time and again we see that as a constraint, uh, it increases. Uh, uh, a lot of the cost and so on and so forth. Uh, again, policy responses uh, that allow more land value capture. Uh, I, I think basically the, the this is not this necessarily just for land value capture, but in in the interest of increasing the transport infrastructure network is uh, increasing the private sector participation. So. Uh, one of the things that uh, uh, that government has, has, I think the government has responded positively to that, but it's more like letting the private sector uh, develop the the some of the major projects, but also the internal community uh, last mile connections, because this is this is where most of the private developers are 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 in. It's just that they need to be guided so that they're all connected. So that, I think those are some of the things that come to mind right away. Uh, I, I think also one last uh, comment on the planning process is that uh, the, traditionally we look at the trajectory, existing trajectory of demand and anticipate future demand. But what this has resulted in is a dendritic approach. You know. Uh, Metro Manila is big, it requires more, so let's build more roads that, to serve Metro Manila. You know? So it just in, reinforces. So I think you also need to look strategically and say, hey, maybe we need to build redundancy and also look at climate change so that we don't need a dendritic form. Maybe we need to go to a network grid so that we're more strategic. So that, that strategic thinking input, mm -hmm. I think also needs to be put uh, or, or reinforced in the traditional uh, infrastructure uh, and policy planning process. 
Thank you very much, Art. Um, let me go to ASIC Planta. Um, after hearing the presentation in terms of potential um, development benefits of such projects, um, can you share with us, you know, what are the key considerations of government when it evaluates large infrastructure projects? I think, you know, our audience would very much appreciate that. Yeah, thank you again, Wena. Well, uh, technically it's been uh, the same uh, since uh, forever. Uh, it's basically the analysis uh, and the supply and demand, uh, technical analysis, which uh, incorporates a uh, least cost analysis, uh, uh, analysis of alternatives, timing and the like, financial analysis, economic analysis, economic analysis, environmental, institutional, and social. It's still been the same. Uh, the methodologies has been uh, enhanced for some uh, environmental. So uh, no other considerations, but the uh, same uh, vetting uh, uh, processes. Uh, basically, uh, it's normally incorporated. All those uh, 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 analysis are incorporated in the feasibility study submitted by the implementing agencies. Uh, so that's the basis for the decision making. What the secretary does uh, on the investment coordination committee is to uh, vet uh, the representations made by the implementing agencies. Thank you, Wen. Okay. Thank you very much, Asik Planta. So I think we're almost uh, at the end of our web session, but uh, but we would like to ask our panelists for any last um, words before we close. Uh, maybe start with E and Julia, and then we go through the three panelists. Uh yeah, th thank you, Wena. So I see still a lot of interest uh, in, in our model uh, exercise, so which we haven't uh, uh, addressed yet, but uh, uh, we'll keep working on the model and uh, uh, hopefully get back to you on your questions. These are all very good questions, as I see, uh, for our further development of the study. Julia. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, everyone, for, for the questions. And um, we will try and respond to, to many of those offline. Um, and I think um, what I kind of takeaway that I would like people to take from this is that um, this is really about illuminating the trade-offs and, and the mechanisms and thinking about that broader picture. Um, so, so hopefully it's, it's of value in that. So thanks very much, everyone. Okay, um, as a plant, can we hear uh, your... Some last words from you? <laughs> none, none for us. Uh, the Philippine Development Plan is out, and uh, it's uh, has a nice, uh, uh, interesting uh, game plan for the infrastructure uh, sector, uh, including uh, people-centric transportation. Great. Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Art. Um, no, I, I just look forward to the, the final results tomorrow and be able mm -hmm. to appreciate and. and digest uh, much of what has been uh, uh, presented. Thank you. Jamie? Thank you. As a lonely transport expert amongst all these highly intellectual economists, <laughs> I, I couldn't agree more that transport economics needs a considerable rethink. Our drivers are not necessarily just time savings. They are far more yes. than that. It's road safety, it's emissions, both local and global. And we have to find a way to assess projects differently, whether the benefits or the costs, all of them can be monetized or not. We need to find a way to make sure that we're doing multi-criteria type analysis to ensure we're addressing all of the costs okay. and more importantly, all of the benefits. Thank you. Thank you. So thank you, Yi, Julia, Asik, Eric, Art, and Jamie. So it's a, it was a rich and uh, fruitful discussion. We also like to thank the audience for the questions and spending your Friday afternoon with us. But before we finally close this webinar, we'd like to promote the next um, Asian Impact Webinar, which will be on the 15th of February, um, 2023, uh, at, 4, at 3 p.m., uh, 3 to 4 p.m. Manila time via Zoom. And um, the topic will be on trade, investment, and climate change in Asia and the Pacific. So with that, thank you very much for joining us this afternoon and have a pleasant weekend.